All right, everyone, thanks for joining us for another Trap House podcast. And today, Charlie and I are going to sit down and talk about road trip uh, trapping trips. So, lots to discuss. I know a lot of people want to do that. We're going to talk about, you know, how we approach things and uh, probably some do's and don'ts and all that good stuff. So, hang tight. We're going to dive in. Um, Also, got to give it up to the sponsors, Hags Bracket j3o.com for j3 outdoors check out his line of stuff um we are also with weeby knives check out their website weebyknives.com they got all the skinning and fleshing tools you need we also have top lot stretcher company with us their website is top lot stretcher and uh we've said it a million times their adjustable stretcher is uh very well made and we prefer that And uh, they also have a whole supply um, line as well, so check out their website. And, of course, we got to say a big thank you to Hoosier Trapper Supply. Check out our website. It's HoosierTrapperSupply.com. It's home of the Top Dog Predator Bait and the Jet Fuel Predator Lure. And I want to mention right now, as uh, these are rolling out, the Hoosier Trapper Outdoor Show is on YouTube. We're releasing every other week. So uh, if you haven't tuned into that, you might want to jump on there and see where we're at. We're showing a lot of footage, footage in Arkansas. Then we got some footage for South Carolina. And then we do our semi-live series here around uh, farm ground here in Indiana. And join us at the Catch Circle on Facebook as well. It's a great community of trappers. People can share, sell, uh, get ideas, tips, ask questions, whatever. Anything trapping related is uh, fine by me. So hop on uh, Facebook Trapping Circle. And, or I'm sorry, the catch circle, not the trapping circle. And last but not least, we have to say, please join a trapping organization of some sort, uh, either with your state or national level. There's Fur Takers of America, the National Trappers Association, uh, or you can even help out and donate or become a member of the Sportsman's Alliance even. Uh, they do great things for trappers and uh, hunters and fishermen and all that good stuff as well. But uh, they do take care of us. So I want to encourage everyone to to join and help fight the fight. So, all right, enough rambling. We're going to get Charlie out here and talk about uh, road trip trapping. All right, Charlie's here with us. Like I said, road trip trapping, state hopping, <laughs> circling the globe. Whatever you got to do to get out there and trap. Right. <laughs> so a couple things I want to mention before we get started. We actually had a question come in. Uh, and the question was, the guy had had a uh, bobcat in a snare in a cable restraint in a state that required a cable restraint, which is kind of, at this point, need, well, actually, it's going to factor into the answer. So he, the bobcat took a lunge and actually pulled the cable stake out of the ground. And he said it was good, hard soil ground. So he wanted to know if a like a J.C. Connor shock spring within that cable restraint would help him out. And I'm kind of thinking, I was like, I, I guess I really don't have a good answer for you. Um, and he wasn't sure if it was going to be legal to do that um, because you'd be altering the cable restraint. And also, I would think that with as much give as a cable restraint has, as far as being non-relaxing... Um. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to fit a legal, um, a, you know, um, re- you know, within the reg- the legal regulations of using a cable restraint. So I guess so. For those of you watching this on YouTube, if you want to make a comment below on what your thoughts are on that, um, let us know. I'm actually kind of thinking that um, that possibly the cable stake may have not been fully set so when you know when we we drive a cable stake in we always set them so in other words when you go in vertically we give a good tug so it flips that stake horizontally and that way for one thing we're using our judgment as to whether that stake's going to hold and then if we are in question then we can always run another stake on a double stake so i'm kind of wondering if maybe that stake wasn't fully set or not set at all because some guys don't set them they just wait for the animal to do it 
And if you don't set them in the grounds right, sometimes that stake will just come straight up and, yeah, you know, not not come out of there. So, um, I don't know. That's kind of my thoughts. I, I've only had one other time a guy tell me that he had a cable stake fail on a snared animal. And um, snared animal uh, by the neck. It was a coyote, and it pulled the stake. But it had rained super heavy, and... You know, in the, the same circumstances, that rebar would have been out of there, too. So, uh, you know, had it been double-staked, it probably would have been fine. But when you've got a snared animal, that's essentially like a horse with a horse collar. <laughs> you know, you got all four legs working. Um, you got uh, adrenaline and all that factored in. And so, um, when, when, when you're, ever you're staking something, obviously, you got to use your judgment. got to use your judgment all the time in trapping, but staking is definitely something you got to use your uh, judgment on. So. Don't underestimate a coyote, that's for sure. No, and and this, and this other one was a bobcat. So, um, anyways, just thought we'd start with that, and now we'll talk about going out of state. So, so this is something Charlie um, talks about at conventions. He kind of demos this. Mm-hmm. Well, talks about it. You don't really demo it, but and we get this question fairly often. Right. Like, what? Where should they start? What should they do? Who do they contact? As far as getting out of state permission to go trap. Yeah, just what the what's the check off list is essentially to, to go do this. So um with that being said, we're going to we're going to put just the nuts and bolts of this how to um information on the how to section of yeah, our YouTube page on Hoosier Trapper Outdoors. So it'll be under the how to section. So for those of you, you know, that want to go in and reference it later, It'll be there. Yeah, of course, the podcast will be there, too. But yeah. um, anyways, so we get this question a lot because we do this a lot. We take at least typically we take two trips a year and we normally go after Christmas. And um, I guess you got to go look at it to what your perspective is. So do you want to catch an animal that you're not catching at home? Uh, do you want to just trap different geography or all of the above? Uh, just opportunities, you know, sometimes sometimes it's got the grasses greener on the other side of the fence aspect to it. But more than anything, it's a lot of times just different geography, different different animals that you're not able to catch at home. Initially, years, years ago, um, back before we ever started filming Hoosier Trap Rod Doors, uh, Jake was only like in second grade, I think, when, when mm-hmm. we first started going. We went to Kansas, and none of that was filmed for a show or anything. Uh, and the perspective on that was number one, just to go trap Kansas, but it was the, the other objective was certainly to go catch a bat, bobcat, um, which we definitely accomplished. So, so I guess the first starting point that I would look at for people that are thinking about going out of state is: Do you have relatives or good friends that live out of state that um, would be a good person to network off of? So, if you have a farmer relative, that's great and a lot of times they'll um allow you to trap their farm if someone isn't already there and then they will obviously they know other farmers in the area and you get network that way and get permission that way um same with friends the same with um friends that go on hunting trips they may have a contact for you so originally when we went to kansas we i went through a friend and he had a friend that was a outfitter, hunting outfitter for both bird hunting and deer hunting in Kansas. So we were able, basically, had uh, more ground than we could cover in you know, in the ten days we were gone, going through that guy's leased hunting ground. So, uh, and he was he was glad to have us there for nesting bird protection, and then also, um, you know, just and then we we enjoyed doing it as well. So. So that that right there, if you have that type of contact or that type of way to network off of somebody, that's that's a good way to go. If you take a hunting trip, sometimes you can network off of that as well. So, um, you know, just depending on the circumstances of the trip, if you're where you're at or whatever, and you get to know the the guide or outfitter or the owner of the outfitting place, you might be able to work that way as well. So, uh, all of these things are things that you want to keep in mind. Now, so if that doesn't work out, <laughs> what do you do? So at that point, then you want to just start looking at what states offer what you want to trap and have adequate amounts of public ground 
and then are they trapper friendly? Because some states are certainly more trapper friendly than others. And I'm not talking whether it's legal or illegal. I'm just talking in the regulations that they have. Um, some states are just definitely more open to trapping than others are uh, in, in regard to the regulations. Um, for example, we trapped Tennessee a couple years ago, and they actually used to be a soft catch state where you had to use rubber jaw traps. And thankfully for the Tennessee uh, Trappers Association, I don't know if it's Tennessee Fur Harvesters, you know, Justin? Uh, yeah. Tennessee Fur Harvesters. Um, uh, John Daniels, uh, you know, which is now the, the NTA president, they really did a lot of work in, in Tennessee, and they got that where, you, you know, just use a typical offset jaw trap. They got rid of the rubber jaw trap requirement. Um, and I've mentioned this in the past. The perspective on that, the reason that was like that originally in, in Tennessee, wasn't the animal rights perspective. It was um, dog hunters. They just had a stronger clout uh, within the legislator or within the, you know, within the, yeah, within the legislators back years ago. And they just got that stuff initially set up that way. So, um, but a lot of that, fortunately, in Tennessee has been changed. So you, I, I guess you want to make sure the state you're going to um, allows you to use the equipment that you presently have. Or if you have to buy additional equipment, it's not going to be crazy, you know, cost-wise. The other thing is we have this um, reciprocal state, this reciprocity, where... Um, if, for instance, in Indiana, we allow non-resident trappers to come here and trap. And we actually treat them pretty good. For one thing, Indiana is a trapper-friendly state. Uh, regulations are good. Um, and our licenses are not crazy expensive for non-residents. I don't even remember what they are. Do you know? No, I don't. It's not, it's not bad, though. Yeah, Considering compared to others, it's not bad at all. Right. We've paid as high as 350 bucks for a non-resident license in, in a, well, New Mexico. It's one. Um, so... For instance, Minnesota, they do not allow non-resident trappers. And they are not allowed to go to another state that um, has that reciprocal law. So they can't come to Indiana to trap because we... They won't allow us, we won't allow them. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's what it comes down to. So, you know, with the present fur market conditions, I I don't see a reason for these laws to be like that. Not the the reciprocal law, but for the state not to allow non-resident trappers. You know, I, I, back in the 70s and 80s when fur prices were really high, a lot of that stuff stemmed from that. Um, yeah. Everybody flocking to one state to harvest that or they, or whatever. Right. That or they just they just wanted to keep it for themselves. That. You know. Yeah. So um, I remember, I, th- I think it was, well, for example, I believe it was South Dakota. They used to allow non-resident trappers. Well, then fur prices got high. Some some guys did go up there and ca- trap some critters, and I've talked to some of them. And this is years ago, 70s. So then they shut that down. Um, they shut the non-resident trapping down, and then, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, they opened it back up to non-residents. Well, at that time, muskrats were high, so then a lot of people ran up there to trap muskrats. Well, then some people got upset about that so then they (laughs) so then they they changed the law where non-residents could still trap south dakota but they weren't allowed to trap if you they weren't they were trying to avoid muskrat trappers so they they wouldn't allow you to trap after a certain date march 15th or whatever so in other words the ice is still going to be on (laughs) (laughs) so so there's some things out there like that too that you're definitely going to have to have to keep um, an eye on um, another that I back up just a little bit another one is these private hunting clubs a lot of times once you get known or you can do it as a control um, job um, sometimes they'll they'll pay you to do the job they'll provide you a place to stay might even they'll buy your license that kind of thing and if you can get in on those great um, there's uh definitely trappers out there that do that oh yeah so um they're a little harder to come by um we have run into circumstances where uh we weren't compensated but we're on some private hunting leases and they kind of want to tell you what to do and i don't really like that because they don't they're not trappers so yeah i don't mind i'll i'll take a i'll take a casual suggestion but as far as getting specific you know 
Just let it. Just turn us loose and let us go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, for yeah. instance, we had one spot <laughs> where a guy that hunting ground private I won't even say the state, but somehow there was like what? How many beavers caught in this little ditch? Ninety. Ninety beavers caught in this ditch. And, you know, so he knew where they all were, and they had that many, and. And it would have been... It was it, not true, right. obviously. Right, it wasn't... Yeah, it would have been a typical colony with, you know, some adults and some two-year-olds and... Well, actually, the two-year-olds might have even been out of there because we were in there in February. So, adults, possibly two-year-olds, and, and then that year's litter. So, you're talking six to ten beavers, you know, max. And this guy was telling us that the last guy had caught 90 there. <laughs> you know, so... Anyways, you run into all kinds of crazy stuff. So, um so, anyways, let's go back. We're um, start looking at states that you might be interested in going. And I guess we originally, like I said, originally went to Kansas, and that was through a private lease. And I and I um, switched gears, and we actually skipped a year that we didn't go out of state, which seemed really weird. So I'm never doing that again. <laughs> and then the following year, um, we went to Arkansas. And I, I, I think what stuck with my mind about Arkansas was I had a buddy from years ago that went to Arkansas and they had a great time. And they actually camped out in the tent on National Forest ground and trapped. Probably wasn't super efficient, you know, but they had a good time and caught a little bit of stuff and slept in the tent and whatever. So, um, so I, I guess we looked at Arkansas first. Or you did. Yeah. I, I'm just now learning about this. I didn't yeah. know how you came up with Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> jo- yeah, Justin was just kind of right along for the ride to begin with. <laughs> yeah. yeah essentially um so yeah that, that was kind of when you first started trapping really i mean you you trapped around here for a little bit but then you then you pretty much jumped in with both feet and then you went on that hunt that that uh, yeah trapping pretty trip. much yeah so um back up where i was at here oh anyway so we lo- looked at arkansas and okay we looked at the regulations they have they've got a lot of public ground they've got um uh wildlife management areas and national forests that are uh allowed trappers mm-hmm. and they have some that don't so you got to be you got to be a little bit careful that typically they're smaller w- wma stuff wildlife management areas um the larger ones there's usually not an issue with trapping but definitely they're in the arkansas regulations they list them specifically by each one and then um then there's national forest ground um the way i understand it wmas are managed by the state within and that's typically as federal ground but the wmas are managed by the state with food plots and that kind of thing wildlife management areas so um so we looked at that and we we picked out a place on the map and we drove down there basically took a day to get there um we checked out a couple areas that that's yeah. one thing if you can or if possible before you even go out on one of these trips and you got a spot in mind based on a map and what you've heard and what you've seen online if you can go scout it out in person that's huge right uh, not everyone does that you know it's it's understandable I right it's logistics of it all right but this... we we kind of went we went blind and the first couple of wma spots were not so hot no, no and we just decided to keep driving until we found something that was more adequate for what we were trying to do right so yeah we drove basically it was a 700 mile trip uh looked at it the next morning it, the road access was minimal um it just wasn't wasn't going to really work for what we had in mind. Then we spent the rest of the day driving, and I think we put 350 miles on that day, looking at other WMAs and other national forest areas, and um, came up with the one that we're presently at. And it's uh, big enough, and it's um, got enough road access. Um, just if if you're not walking. Uh, and you're able to drive, you can cover a lot more ground and be a lot more efficient and definitely catch more critters. Oh, yeah. If you're walking and you like just the nostalgic idea of walking with a backpack on or whatever, more power to you. That's that's fine. But um, if you want to kind of have the long-lining aspect to it, you know, you need that, you need that road access. 
So, um, another thing that you want to look at is so you pick out an area and if you got to make sure that there's enough ground there. I mentioned this, this one had enough ground. So, for example, this one is a 200,000 plus acres. Um, and we can, by the time we get, we're not covering all of it by any means, but I mean, you can get a pretty good loop going. We've been on, um, so you got, and we're there to trap. That's all we're doing. We're not, we're not hunting. We're not sun up to sun down. We're right, trapping. Right. We're not sightseeing. We're, we're there to trap. So, um, you want to make sure you got adequate ground to trap. You don't, you know, a thousand acres, 300 acres, 1200 acres, even 2000 acres is not going to be enough. Uh, unless that's just what you want to do. Um, but if you want to do like kind of a long liner thing, it's going to, it's going to definitely take more ground. So, um, we were on a ranch in, um, New Mexico, private ranch. That was the last trip that we made to New Mexico and it was 50, I don't know, 52,000, 54,000 acres. It was an awesome place. Kind of like the play. It was like their own private national park. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> private ranch though, cattle ranch. And believe it or not, that sounds really big, but a lot of that Western ground is so wide open. So it's, a lot of it, you're not going to set. So, you know, four or five days in, we pretty much had it yeah. set up. I mean, really. Yeah. All the, any crossings or edges on all that stuff. Drainages. Yeah, yeah. You, you had it all figured out. You could see it easier. So, yeah, it was, you know, it was, um, so always bear in mind uh, how much, ground there is and how much time you have available and, and what your perspective is are you there to trap all day so um, the idea too when we leave like when we're trapping around here it's kind of like okay we got just this short window of time and we might have two or two hours or three hours in the morning to go do this uh, and then we got to get in here and work it's, it's, it's our busiest time of year and um, when we leave on a trip, we don't have any other distraction other than phone. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, we don't. We're not like we're seven hundred miles away. It's not like we can drive home and and work. So we're going and we're you know we're there to trap. So that's the other thing. All of us that are taking a vacation or whatever to go trap, that's what you're there to do. So you, you got to think of that as well. So um, definitely, definitely important to to kind of bear that in mind. It makes it more enjoyable that way too, in my opinion. It does. You're stressed about everything going on at home or at work and all the stuff. You know, it's a vacation. Get out outdoors and trap. You know, right. Have a good time. Right. It's it's way more enjoyable, in my opinion. Right. Right. Uh, and it's kind of nice to just be. I've trapped both ways, out of state, where you're jumping from uh, farm to farm or ranch to ranch. Uh, and driving a bunch of miles, hitting properties, which is probably realistically the way a lot of times it's going to go when you do an out-of-state trip, assuming you got the line, the ground lined up, or um, you're on one giant piece of property, which I really appreciate. And you're basically when you're on that property, you can trap anywhere you're driving, essentially. So, you know, you got to obviously keep in mind areas that might have a little more public travel or whatever and, and avoid those but um generally speaking you want to try to i mean it's nice to have one piece of property and you're not leaving it so you don't have downtime traveling between proper property to property so uh one thing of utmost importance if you're trapping public ground is what's going on there on that ground when you plan to be there yeah because it's not just you no, it, and it, well, most cases, if it's not, yeah, if it's public, it's public. It's it open can be to anything. It's open to everybody. So, obviously, you want to avoid gun season for deer. I mean, that's like a national holiday. So everybody and their <laughs> brothers running those roads. You don't want anything to do with that. Um, you don't, you know, and even like the better part of the bow seasons, all that kind of stuff. Just avoid it. Um, we typically go after Christmas. Things are pretty much wound down by then. 
there might be a bow season still in place, but by then generally everybody's over it. You know, there, there might be a few straggler bow hunters out there still, but they're, that's okay. Uh, we're not bothering them. They're not bothering us. Um, but that, that bulk of that full use, uh, for, for hunters, um, that is something that you definitely want to avoid. And I think a lot of us, even when we're trapping here in Indiana, we got to be careful that we're, um, not stepping on toes of people that are deer hunting, gun hunting particularly. Yep. So, I mean, there's ground that we pull out of when gun season comes in just because, um, being courteous to them and, and we don't want issues with stuff getting shot and traps and all that. So, um, you know, that, that's definitely, yeah. Uh, something to, that's very important to keep in mind. Um, I think we've, we trapped one area that was closer to an urban area. Mm-hmm. And it was a giant property. There's plenty of ground there. We caught a lot of critters, but we had more issues with traps being stolen on that property than any, anywhere we've ever been. And it was just basically because that area would just had so much multi-use. It was everything from bicyclers to people camping to people backpacking. And then, um, uh, some dog hunters, um, I think was actually secondary, but there was just so much use in that property, uh, which was great. I mean, that's what it's there for. It's a resource for everyone. Um, but it, it did, it did present some issues as, as trapping. So, um, you know, it's just, just the nature of it. Yeah. It's a pit up with it. And right. So as much as I would like to go back to that property, but we probably won't, but because <laughs> we did, we caught a lot of stuff, particularly we gray. Did. Well, we did. We, I mean, it was gray foxes um, and coyotes. We didn't catch, we only caught two, three cats on that trip, but um, I mean, we caught a lot of coyotes and we caught a lot of gray foxes, which was pretty cool. So um, the other thing is, so when you go on this trip, where are you going to stay? What are you, what are you going to, that's, or, a, that's a big one because especially if you start going further West, like we've done our western trips, it's it can be few and far between mm-hmm. as far as where you're going to stay. So that can get difficult, right? So we are we normally have always unless somebody's provided us a, us a place to stay, we normally buy or not rent a reasonable hotel room. So um, that that's what we you know that's typically what we do, and sometimes. Some of them, and don't don't hesitate to ask. Some of them will have a hunting rate that they'll give to you. Some of them will have a weekly rate that they'll give to you. You know, we're not staying in Holiday Inn, so um, <laughs> you just, I mean, and you ask, you just ask them if they have anything that for somebody that's just not that's going to stay longer than a couple nights. You know, so a lot of hotels like this will have um, workers that come in from out of town that are doing whatever kind of work, um, and um, that'll stay in these hotels so um anyways my wife always tells me not to be bringing anything home no bed bugs or whatever but so far we've never have really had an issue with that so there's been a few places we've stayed where you could actually put the trap under the bed and catch a critter <laughs> <laughs> sometimes yeah so you just gotta and then some guys some guys that we get asked often if we camp if we do any camp if we do camping and it's you know we don't and it sounds really cool. Yeah, sounds like fun. And it sounds nostalgic, and it sounds like the thing to do. But I guess if you think about it, if you're, you're you're trapping all day long, start getting dark, and then you got to go back to your campsite and um, put all the energy into Building fire, fixing supper, getting your just everything going. You know, doing all all the things that go along with camping, which is fine. There again, if you want to do that more power to you um it would be fun it would be a good memory i think and you'd be out there you know right in the under the stars essentially in your tent but um <laughs> or camper so it gets full camper and i think the camper you know if you're doing a camper and you pulled in you got electricity and we're able to take a shower and clean up get rid of that long distance is possibly on your port on your hands or something <laughs> um for us the hotel is um the most probably the more flexible and the most more convenient and allows us more time to trap. Yeah, it is. It's, um, 
Yeah, all the effort you'd take into putting into camping, you could you could do so much more with that time out on the line, and you know, right, exhaust yourself, right. <laughs> And it, you know, nice to come and take a warm shower and get warmed up and get a good meal so you can start it fresh the next day, run hard all day again. I don't know of anybody that really, per se, camps. I know some guys that do plug in a camper uh, on out-of-state trips, but I don't know of anybody that does really a tent camp that hits it hard. I mean, where you're just able to really hit it hard. I don't, I don't think that... Um, Everybody I know that that's long lines out west or wherever uh, typically stays in a hotel or has some sort of cabin or some sort of ranch house, you know, bunkhouse. Um, they're staying in there. I don't know if anybody really tent camping per se. Um, I think if people will do it once or twice, and then they then they'll look for another option. You know, so. <laughs> yeah, they're like, all right, we did this. Yeah, it was fun. Enough of that, it was fun, but. Um, I, th- I think, um, and I've mentioned this before to me, the challenge of going into these scenarios, basically you're dropped in 700, 1100 miles from home. And then you're like, figure it out that, that I really enjoy that, you know, and obviously the f- first year there, there, you're probably not going to do as well as the second year you're there. Um, just because you, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time learning the ground, um, and learning, you know, and we got the, where we go to Arkansas, we got history with our locations, you know, so we're kind of like, we can decide whether we're going to set it or not. Cause based on yeah. past, past history, even though it may look good or whatever. Um, so and it's, and it's crazy too, cause we've been doing Arkansas long enough that we've seen it change. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ground change or if they've done, prescribed burn areas or made the new trails and or did logging clear, logging clear cutting all that so i mean it could really affect where animal movement's going to be so it's been interesting to see how that's been playing out over the right however many years it's been i don't even know yeah we had one for those of you that are watching us on who's your trapper outdoors youtube there was there was one episode and i even talked about it there was a road that was always consistently good in the past probably three years it hadn't been that great and they had taken a road grader down and it was basically a forest service road um or was it for i mean it's it's a muddy road but when they took the road grader down they evidently lowered it enough or whatever so now it just fills with water uh, a lot of it and i think it actually has changed some travel on that yeah we don't catch near as much stuff as we used to no on that no and everything else generally is the same other than you know so we probably you know, we're picking them up on a different one, different road, uh, Forest Service road elsewhere. But that particular one, not so much anymore. It just hasn't been that great. So, um, you know, if it ever gets, if it's if it's dry, where there's not water skin in there, it's probably it probably would be good again. You know, so. But. <laughs> I think, I think the biggest thing on this stuff. Another thing I do want to talk about it. So. It's really, really tempting, and we've done it. When you're loading your truck up, is you're taking, you're taking your predator trapping equipment, you're taking your coon trapping equipment, you're taking your beaver trapping equipment, all this taking stuff. Taking everything. Yeah. Well, try to pick one area that you're gonna that you're gonna focus on. So we we focus on predator trapping. Um, we used to take beaver equipment just in case we saw some beaver activity um it it you will find that that stuff in the truck gets in the way when you're trying to do this other predator you know so we're not pulling a trailer everything's in the back of the truck to be efficient we're not you know we can catch plenty of raccoons at home um you know if raccoons were 30 bucks that'd be a different story but they're not um so you know just go after what you want to catch uh and enjoy it and that kind of brings me to another point that I want to make is we get asked, us like, well, how do you justify doing this? You know, <laughs> you're making money on How are you making money? It's like, well, okay. You got to catch a lot of fur to pay for that gas. Yeah. And that, that light out of state license and all that. So now we're not making money. I mean, there was, there's been some years where we broke even, um, uh, maybe even made a little bit back when fur prices were better, but generally speaking, no, we're not making money. I look at this as, the same thing as a guy taking an out-of-state 
hunting trip, whether they're going antelope hunting, moose hunting, whatever, what that costs. We're doing it far cheaper than that, and we're going and having a, a, an experience, an adventure, and we're doing what we enjoy. That is the perspective on this. And, um, I mean, that's where we're at. I mean, if we, and if we, the, the fur check's always nice, but um, it is not the main motive of taking these, these trips for us. And I, and other people that I've talked to, I mean, there's some of them taking pretty seriously and they'll, and they hit it hard enough and they'll stay long enough. They'll take, take six or eight weeks and they're able to do that. Unfortunately, we only normally have, we try to get 10 check days, uh, which then you need a day on the, on that front end for, so that's 11 days. And then you normally have a day of travel there and a day of travel home. So you're up to like two weeks. So, um, when you're a, you know, small business owner, <laughs> well, you need to get home and get to work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so. both, of, yeah, both of us. So when, yeah, when we're both gone, we're taking, um, 40% of the workforce out here, or 30% of the workforce out yeah. here. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we're up against that too. And everybody else says they got a limited vacation. You got obligations to your family, how long you can be gone. So this stuff is just, just fit it in the best you can budget wise. If you got a friend that's going to allow you to place, give you a place to stay. So then you just got your license and gas, you know, it's just, um, just what we enjoy doing. It's not, it's, you know, we're most trapping things. If you took a look at it, you'd probably be better off just go work in a, um, just an average job and you would do much better than you would trapping. So, you know, it's, um, that's, that is not the perspective of this. And I, and for those of you that, that think it is, then more power to you. But I, <laughs> that's you know those those days were were several years ago realistically those days were several years ago so um i think the thing that you want to keep in mind is just and to be flexible not to get something set in your mind that um this is what we're doing uh clearly had we done that we might have just tucked tail and came home the first time we drove to arkansas because you know the first I don't know, three or four properties we looked, were looked at was like, you know, we're just striking out. Yeah. You know, we finally came across one that was going to work for what we had in mind for our, the style of trapping that we were going to do. Um, and something always happens. Yeah. Some, something doesn't go with your plan. Right. You just got to work around it. Right. I mean, some people just freak out or melt, have a meltdown, you know. You know, bury, you, you, you might bury your truck down to the frame. We've done that. We've done that. <laughs> You might blow some tires. You might, you know, not have the property that you were told you were going to have. Yeah. <laughs> Things like that happen. Yeah. We've had all that. Yeah. And, um, and that, that there's, yeah, there's two things I want to mention there. So one is equipment. Uh, one being when you have your set of equipment, whoever else is going, have their set of equipment and then have everything that you're bringing have duplicates or triplicates of. You know, disposable stake drivers, trowels, sawdbusters, sifters, uh, all of that stuff is really easy to leave laying in the woods or to have fall out of your pack basket or just get caught up in the scenario and you'll leave it laying there and you'll pick it up the next day. Make sure you have plenty of extra equipment. So can you imagine being 700 miles from home and you've only got one trowel and you break it or whatever? So, I mean, you are you are... Yeah, it's another expense, but you probably should have backup equipment when you're at home. So when you go on these trips, make sure you got plenty of backup equipment because you could be rendered, you know, uh, out of out of service basically for yeah. two or three days until somebody shipped it to you. Assuming you were going to even wait for that. So that even goes for your dispatch weapon. Yeah, I mean Charlie would tell you I accidentally left a gun next to a tree uh, an hour away <laughs> to go back and get it. Yeah. <laughs> it's pouring down rain. I mean, I see how it happened. <laughs> yep. You're trying to hurry, get out of the rain, and yeah. It was probably longer than an hour. It was like three hours, probably. <laughs> hour and a half each way or yeah. something. It was a long It was, it a, was long a long time. And we only had one gun with us. So that we, you know, we're not going to go back and get it again. Yeah, we don't, we're not doing that again. So, fortunately, nobody took it. It was pouring down rain. There weren't that many people in the, in the woods or whatever. So, um, <laughs> So, anyways, that that equipment is is uh, very important. What were you talking about? I was going to make another um, comment about something a minute ago. I don't know. Oh, 
So we've been invited a number of times over the years to go to a specific property that is literally eaten up with bobcats or eaten up with coyotes. And um, they're like just everywhere. And we've, we've taken some, a few of those trips. And um, they weren't ate up. They, <laughs> generally speaking, it has not, you know, it has not been an issue. So, I mean, it, it not, it not an issue for them. So, yeah, there's some critters there. I mean, you're never going to be able to eliminate everything. So it's kind of like, you know. And this is from a deer hunter perspective. We've talked about this before. So, the, you know, the deer hunter perspective and the trapper, the reality of trapping are two different things. Um, you know, deer, hunt, deer hunters, um, they haven't been, tra- they're not trappers, so they don't understand all of this. So, um, you know, that it, and I guess when you're going into that type of situation, kind of bear that in mind that it may not be what they're talking about. Right. So <laughs> I think that kind of wraps this up. We can do a follow up to this if you guys want to put some questions down below. Um, Justin, so over all the years we've been doing this, what what's your what was your best one of your best experiences? Man, that's hard to say. There, I mean, there's been a lot. There, there there's been so many good ones. I always think every year I try and do something I've never done, or hope that something happens that I haven't seen, or you know. And I think that's came true for most of the trips we've taken. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know that my first Western cat always sticks out big time in New Mexico. Yeah, that was very that cool. one really because it it didn't even look like a cat for one. Nice, and then you know you get out and the wind's blowing and you can just see that fur. <laughs> and that was actually that, the, that, that was, was actually crazy. the cat the photo that that Adrian worked off of for the, yeah. the painting that he did. Yeah, uh, Trapper Adrian did a painting for. Yeah, he sells prints and uh, I, he he gave me a canvas print of it. He still has original, I believe, or sold the original i don't know where it ended up but yeah that was a pretty cool experience and then yeah it's too hard to say i mean there's been so many cool ones there's been a lot of them there have been a lot of them i have one that i guess sticks in my mind presently is when this was back before justin and i and the three of us went jake justin and i jake and i went jake was quite young and i was actually trapping with another guy friend and this was back in the can when we were in kansas years ago and we'd set this was the first check day and we set up, uh, I think we had 35 or 36 sets in the ground or whatever, but roughly that many sets. And we checked every location or checked every trap that, that, that first check day. And we didn't catch a thing. We didn't catch a possum or a skunk, which would past history in Kansas told us that we were going to catch a lot of possums <laughs> and, and, and probably a fair amount of skunks because we always did. And we didn't catch anything. It was like nothing moved. And we got to the second to the last trap and my buddy caught a, bobcat well that made the day so we're all you know all really excited about that and we round the corner uh it was along a creek and a high bank of a creek and it was wooded um and in that last trap had another bobcat in it and that was technically it was my trap so we we caught a double on bobcats but the way the scenario was we couldn't get we couldn't get a picture of either one of them um then it's the same frame yeah but it was you couldn't see one from the other. But even though they were actually probably within twenty five or thirty yards of each other, you just couldn't see the two at the same in the same shot. But that that was one that, of course, Jake was young and and um, but that was one of that was a good memory. That, I mean, and there's been lots of them over the years. But that's one, I guess I'll. <laughs> so with that being said, what's some of your what's some of the ones that were the most challenging, or the most difficult, or the most miserable, or the most whatever? Oh man. We've had, I, we've had a lot of those too. We've had some miserable days out there for sure. Uh, where were we? It was an Arkansas trip. Ice Northern, storm came in. Northern Arkansas. Northern Arkansas, Arkansas. And it was basically, we just got there. You know, we've only had a few days of getting out, didn't we? Day it was only like two check days and then yeah. it just all hit. Then that hits. So, and then, you know, you got the property owner telling us, you're probably better off getting out of there while you can because of the way the driveway with the slope and the trees and might lose power lines and everything. So it's like, well, we got to go pull all our traps. Yeah, that, and, well, that, that, it was an ice storm warning, and there yeah. was a fair amount of snow on the ground. When we got there, it was like 70 degrees, not dry, no snow, nothing. And it just made like a 180. Yeah. So fighting the elements to get out of there and get your traps and... Uh, 
I remember getting rained on slash snowed on. Yeah, with yeah. with not anything dry out on us at all. I mean, down to the bone. But you still had to grab the steering wheel to drive this gator thing. Yeah, I don't even know what it was. It didn't even have a windshield. So you're just getting all the elements. In my hands, I thought, oh, we're going to have to amputate them. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to turn black and we're going to cut my fingers off. It's over. That, well, we made it out. <laughs> that one sticks in my mind as the, the that most was the miserable worst. day. <laughs> <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll never forget it. So I'm, I'm not going to say that it's a good memory, but it's, it's definitely a memory and it's something we'll never forget. That's for sure. And I remember on that same trip that afternoon, it, was, it probably snowed a foot. And I remember standing on that that the dam of this pretty good sized lake. This was all this was all private, and it was just I mean it was snowing super hard. And I don't know if I did a video or you just took my picture or what the deal was, but I remember that one specifically. It was just it yeah. was coming down like, and then it just winter wonderland. Yeah, it, it it was beautiful, and that and then and I didn't have four wheel drive truck then, so it was like that was a bit scary because there was a couple roads. It's like I don't even know if we can even make it up up that fortunately we did i don't know how you know but that one stuck in my mind is that is the right up there i mean we've been we've been buried to the frame we've had lots of flat tires and all that you know whatever but nothing that was that yeah, was that was that was a bad day and, you know we've, we've been, had flooded waters we couldn't cross cross creeks or anything like that where we had to backtrack 45 minutes or whatever but but that was that one was something <laughs> and then we got everything pulled and we're driving and the roads are crap they're terrible slick and remember that night we were just driving it's pitch dark and we were oh yeah and we were going through um it was we were in northern arkansas and we were actually going through mark twain national forest it's one of those areas where i was talking about where to stay how it can be few and far between there was nowhere to stay at all i'm glad we had a full tank of gas I mean, it yes, was, it we was, had to drive and drive and drive. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yep. That was. I won't forget that. Yeah, and I don't remember <laughs> if we were even in using a GPS. I think we were just going off a paper map or something. I don't remember, but it was. It was. That was a long evening. That was, and we finally got. <laughs> we finally got to a town. and got to a. I think it was about ten, ten thirty, because we were able to find a restaurant to eat at, and we got a hotel. But that that was that was one of them days, that. Yep. We've all had miserable days. I remember, you know, but that was one that I won't forget. I was, I was thinking of some other good good days that you're talking about. One of the memorable trips, other than that Bobcat, and then obviously my very first Bobcat ever in Arkansas. Uh, that was which that was that actually was cool. that was actually the first Bobcat that was that we ever caught. Bob in in Arkansas was the yeah. one you caught. Yep, and that's all on film and stuff. So I'll always be able to go back and check that out, and then. And then all the other cool, like, weird incidents that's happened, you know. Um, like, we didn't catch the mountain lion, but we we can almost, you know, almost say 100% sure that's what was at Oh yeah, one of my sets, you know. Yeah. Or, like, almost caught one, which the set wasn't designed for at all, but it was still neat. Then run into a guy running his dogs after lions, and he ends up treeing one. Who knows if it was that one or not, but... right. Uh, just cool to be in that environment and see stuff like that while you're out and about, and then, and knowing that you could have that potential of it, catching something like that. Right. That was that was so that well, was a, that was cool. That was a that was a challenging day though when when um, the guy was running the lions because it was snowing and we were mm-hmm. when we when we got to the national forest. This was in New Mexico when we got to the national forest and this was all duck. We got it on. I don't remember what season it is, but it's on one of the Hoosier Trapper Outdoors. In the in the high desert, it wasn't snowing, and we could look up in the mountains and see that there was snow. And the, and the, the, you know, the more we kept climbing, I think we were at about five thousand, and we got to nine thousand something feet elevation. Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly where we were at, where we started hitting snow, a fair amount of snow, and we kept, you know, in those mountain roads. And I'm not, I mean, we're, you know, there's there's probably I don't know six eight inches of snow on the ground, maybe a little bit more. You know, we're driving in that. Um, in those mountains, and we got it. We decided to go ahead and pull because the trip was not producing; it wasn't doing much at all. Yeah, uh, it, that was actually <laughs> actually that was not the trip that you missed the mountain lines on, but um, that was another different one, different trip, but different property. Yeah, but um, and then when we got down at the end of the day, there was no snow. It was beautiful. We got remember it was just weird. Yeah, <laughs> just that <laughs> high elevation. Yeah, 
I don't know what I don't know what the elevation was when the snow kicked in and was blizzard like essentially and then but but yeah good times it was a good time so make more this year like I was saying I like to do something I've never done before I've never trapped Kansas we're going to Kansas this year we intend to go to Kansas yeah yeah most likely we'll end up there but you never know and uh I've never caught a badger and I'm assuming this property this area is going to be yeah you know have some badger potential for us yeah yeah so I'd like to check that one off my bucket list there yeah <laughs> so I guess I, I for those of you that want to take the take the leap at this I, I can't recommend it enough I think you'll have a great time um you know just uh just go out with with the uh, expectation of having a good time having a new experience a new adventure um new challenge and um I don't think you'll regret it most people that do this they may not be able to do it every year but they'll do it every other year or whatever and then some of them do it every year you know we just had a guy in here um, a couple of days ago and he was heading to Kansas. He was leaving in about a week and, uh, he just, you know, he lives here in the Midwest. So he was, uh, anxious to get out there. He went last year for the first time and did pretty well. And then he's going back this year. And so, um, so yeah, there's a number of people that do the state hopping thing for sure. Oh yeah. You know, so, um, and there's some, that's some that make some money and they're, you know, most of us don't, you know, <laughs> cause we're just limited on time and you know, whatever. But anyways, Okay, anything you want to add to that? I think that's it. I don't have any concluders here. Yeah, that's my concluders. Go out and just have a good time. Just and enjoy have it. fun and get out there. See see some new geography and have make some new experiences. And if you can bring family or friend along, friends along, then all the better. So, yep. So, we'll catch you next time. And until then, make sure you're watching all the Hoosier Trapper Outdoors. Follow along on Facebook, Instagram, all our social media platforms. We got the email newsletter that's out there too. Uh, you can sign up on our homepage at hoosiertrappersupply.com. And uh, I think that's it. Yep. All right. We'll see you later. <laughs>